All right. Uh, it's wonderful to stand up here a second time, uh, humbly, uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, in some ways, I'm here because Ishmael, uh, he really encouraged me to try and look into this, and I really hope that I can give, it's a real hard challenge to give good credit to a good artist, his world, and their context. A real challenge. I think I'm glad to say that when, when, when this, our, our pre my presentation finishes, Paul marks the speak. Um, that is a very important thing. Um, the type of thing and the type of dialogue that needs to happen. Um, and I think that's why these conferences are wonderful. And I appreciate Paul's willingness and Ishmael's work and many um, who have come here to speak and discuss these issues and work on well, uh, I'm here today to talk about uh, Silver Jim Jacobs, um, to give a little context about who he was, a master artist, and a little bit about his world. Of course, we are on Kwan land today, and I wish to acknowledge that. Of course, thank everyone for their work that has went towards the conference so many people have. Ishmael for organizing this session. It's a session that's needed to happen. And of course, acknowledge that uh, some of this information that I'm sharing, I cannot take credit for. Um, Ishmael and Carol Jacobs have, have been, have shared a lot of good information. And I'm still learning. So uh, I, I'm very much the student. Um, what am I going to speak about here? Uh, an overview. Briefly mention, just real quickly, some problems in the study of Northwest Coast Park history. Um, talk a little bit about, just briefly, who, who, who was Silver Jim Jacobs? Um, and attribute some of his work. And there's a reason why I'm just giving credit to individual artists and really discuss you know, why it matters to attribute art to artists. Uh, to speak a little bit on this problems in Northwest Coast Art history, if you can see this right here, these five so-called presented stages of understanding art history. This is sometimes or often the framework that has been used to conceptualize um, Northwest Coast history from a so-called pre-contact period, an early, a golden age, sounds good and romantic even, a quiet period where apparently Lincoln art was and Klein and Clinkett culture, there's been arguments made about that. I, I don't agree with that. I mean, in this contemporary art period uh, where there's this sort of resurgence from things that you know had, had gone away. And this question that I've posted here, should the structure of this examination be heavily revised or completely discarded? Um, I think, if anything, if we study Silver Jim or various artists, and when we have to look at the details of some of these people, it really causes these stages that others have put up to crumble. Because if we look even at Silver Jim, his work occurs during the so-called quiet period, when, there, when some have said there was not a lot of work going on. Um, and really, to talk about art history, there's a few elephants in the room. Uh, one, you know, this a lot of scholarship, if you read older studies, um, and maybe even some today, if you go to museums or um, read a lot of books, uh, some of the scholarship and presentations that have been made about Clinkett art have come through or, or by Euro-Americans, and it's been framed in a Euro-American worldview. And if you're a Clinkett person reading this, you've almost got to try and push away some of this to see what's maybe really in there. Um, and of course, you know, how often have the artists of these works been attributed in exhibits and in these books? If you're familiar with the study of oral literature, um, there's this big problem with, you know, anonymous storytelling where books are published and the artist is never attributed. How authentic is that? Um, so it's a different thing, but there's such an importance. So a lot of art history, and there's been this problem with Native Americans and Clinkett being a stereotype, and this is a good, I'd say a good racist example of a photograph where a photographer dressed up some individuals and put robes around them to make them look real indigenous so he could sell this as some sort of authentic Indian type of presentation. Very sort of controversial photo, but that's what was presented, or how it was printed, presented by <coughs> Clinkett and Clinkett artists were 
there is a real sort of sensitive and a real, you know, we have to get into these issues of race and culture to even talk about art history. Um, of course, again, you know, we need to, I would argue, as we talk a little bit more, to attribute artists. Um, I, I really appreciate Ishmael and others who've encouraged these type of dialogues um, that, that would need to happen, and especially have Paul uh, conclude here. Um, so maybe to get a little bit more, who, who was Silver Jim Jacobs? Uh, some of you are sure know, but he was born around 1846, died in 1914. Um, he was a Puskedi clan man um, of the Chassid or the Cow House in Sitka. Had uh, two Clinket names. Um, he had Nalu a dead raven, uh, which it seems like his connections in Yakutat, most people in Yakutat knew him by that name. And then his Kitchcock, the name he often was known by in Sitka, it seems, where he generally lived. Um, of course, uh, you know, but, uh, he, he, who he married, he married a, a good cog wanton woman. He was, you know, and just to really give an overview, he was really a master carver, painter, and a jeweler. He really, he kind of did it all. Uh, family ties to Yakutat and Sitka, clan ties to all. Um, and he's an artist, yeah, you, you can say, yeah, he, uh, was one of those that catered to tourists and sold art to tourists, but he was an individual that made art for the community. Uh, um, and a lot of times, if, you know, I mentioned this, some of these concerns about past scholarship, a lot of times scholars in the past just examined or studied art that was in museums. And then these scholars would sit and talk about this art, often without talking to the native community, and make all sorts of uh, assumptions in, in a, you know, in a very ivory tower sort of room without really understanding or talking about what art was. A lot of these pieces he made, it wasn't just art in the Euro-American sense where it sits on the wall like a nice painting. These pieces have great uh, ooh, There's spirit, there's a deep tie, and that's a, a big presentation which others, um, I'm sure, are hoping to talk about. Um, these pieces have great significance. Um, of course, you know, it is important to mention, not a big focus. Yeah, he did, um, did produce art for tourists, oftentimes jewelry, and was considered by many at the time when he was working in Sitka as the best jeweler. That's what people said. Um, if, in a few older publications, one individual who came through said, uh, speaking about uh, Sitka Jack, and uh, uh, this is the quote, uh, Hitchcock, the silversmiths of the Sitka Kwan are very skillful workmen. During the summer months, they can sell their ornaments faster than they can make them. And in two hours after the steamer's arrival, their stock is exhausted. And they work night and day on special orders. If you give them an order in the morning, the bracelets are ready in the afternoon. Next, another person in 1893 said Sitka Jim, or Silver Jim, he had a number of names, but is known to the tourists by his ability to make spoons and bracelets out of coins and by his fancy prices for the same. Um, there are other jewelers, but he's the best, or so, so they said. Um, I don't have a lot of great pictures to really do justice to his good work, um, but uh, a very skilled silversmith and jeweler. A lot of times there is a focus on uh, Charles Edenshaw, who is a really fantastic a uh, fantastic artist, uh, a Haida artist. Lots of books about him, a new one that shows really the beauty of his work. Um, but I think we could easily have a Silver Jim Jacobs um, book that does a similar type of thing. Um, and of course, you know, his stuff was sold to tourists, but the community wore it. I could probably ask anybody here who's got a silver bracelet on, and there'd probably be a few hands go up. And this is one picture here of a uh, Quashtequan woman, uh, who is sometimes known as Emmeline Baker or Princess Tom. She was a wealthy, uh, you could say, sort of merchant. She lived in Sitka and ran a business, and she was a known purchaser of his bracelets, and she had his bracelets up and down her arms often. Uh, and maybe to talk a little bit more about Silver Jim, um, you know, not the producer of this tour stuff. This is a picture of uh, the, what was called the Sitka Indian Village. 
circa 19, late 1904 or early 1905. And if you were to walk down Sitka, the, the street, you could see some of the monumental pieces that he had produced. Uh, this laser kind of works over here. I'll talk the nest house, uh, or, or the, yeah, me, the truck we hit screen, and then the uh, post here I want to talk about in a minute. But he produced house screens, house posts, clan hats, and other pieces that uh, were and are still used today. Uh, just a few of the major ones, I don't like to say major, that could be not the best way to describe it, but these important pieces he, he produced. Um, I'll talk about them. Um, the uh, White Frog or Frog House piece in 1898, he was commissioned, uh, him and Quady artist Daniel Benson, to carve and paint a white frog for the Dry Bay Luke Nahari clan. Uh, and then and this is a piece of these individuals of the clan, the Luke Nahari folk, uh, standing nearby. And it was later put up on the outside of their house at Sitka as sort of a, a piece. Uh, since a white frog was part of that, that clan and the house's crest. So he was an individual who was commissioned to make these pieces. Um, the truck could hit screen or eagle nest house um, piece. Again, another monumental piece that you can see was put up here on the exterior of the house um, that identified the house. Um, there's, of course, a big history that's detailed in this that's part of that clan, that community's history. But he was an individual with recognized ability that could produce these pieces commission to it. And if you wanted to get into some sort of, I'm not a big uh, art you know, analysis person, but you can see he has a very defined style, very bold style in what you, if you look at the way uh, his pieces are. Um, another piece, the Cogwanton Panting Wolf House Post. Um, he was commissioned at the large 1904 Puig um, that the Cog Wonton had put on. Um, they commissioned him, and this is some of the commissioners standing next to the piece when it was produced. Uh, a real magnificent piece. Um, and I, you'll notice I said the 1904 Kui. Sometimes that's called the last great potlatch. I want to come down or come back to that so called idea of last. Uh, and then there was this canoe in Sitka. Uh, Still trying to figure out a little bit about it, but it does seem to have been a Haida canoe, but painted by Silver Jim. Uh, that's uh, at least there's been some attribution by Emmons and others, and his the way he did some of his work and the bold lines on it. Uh, apparently, this I believe this piece was picked up by Governor John Brady in Sitka for a time. But maybe to move. A little closer to uh, Yakutat, he had a real close connection and he was commissioned to a number of monumental pieces for folks in Yakutat. Um, the 1904, there's this so-called last great potlatch. I really dislike that term, it's such a misnomer. Of course, in 1905, after the so-called last great potlatch, in Yakutat, there was a huge, a whole year nearly, of people hosting um, ceremony where a number of monumental art pieces were produced and put up in houses um, all across Yakutat. And this is just one of them, but this one was produced by Silver Jim, uh, the Tekwadi Kajuk screen, or Golden Eagle screen, and this is it, just sitting up before the event. Um, the initial picture, which I'll show again, is the one that shows him actually standing there working. Yes, sir. Yeah. This is the picture of him standing here painting it. Um, and again, there was that frog I mentioned previously. Um, it, it, it didn't survive the times, but it does seem that in, uh, when, in 1905, as things were, you know, the Yakutat was having all these events, they asked him to create another one. Um, and really, to really bring it to close, I want to save some time for Paul. He did create other pieces of, uh, such as the mouse hat uh, and this thunderbird hat. Um, again, why, why is it important to give attribution? 
um, the breakdown, breaks down past scholarship. It acknowledges a lot of important things. It, it, it gives acknowledgments to clans, their histories, crests, intellectual properties of clans, and details aspects of sovereignty. And attributing an artist contributes to these concepts of, I think it, respect, a big word of respect. Finish, Chief. Thank you.